Wow, man, that is so powerful. I mean, I, I, some of you are like, I don't even know who this guy is. Um, <laughs> this random dude with a mic just steps up on. But my name's Steve Carter, and um, I just want to say, uh, you are a part of an incredible church. I hope you know that. I hope you know that. <laughs> Creating a bridge throughout Houston and beyond so that people can experience faith. Way to live into your name. Hey, I want to invite um, a service host to come down front. They're going to be handing out Bibles because we are beginning a brand new series on the book of Mark. And this whole series is about who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The book of Mark just begins so simply. It just says this is the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. That's how the book begins. And many scholars will say that Mark is the first gospel and that Matthew and Luke basically took from it. It is, it is the smallest gospel. So all of you who don't like to read the Bible, you're welcome. <laughs> it, is, it is a story. It is written. And, and you got to understand words like Christ and Son of God. There, there's so many times throughout this book that Jesus is like, don't tell anybody who I am yet. Don't tell anybody who I am yet, because I want people to experience, not just hearing about me, but I want them to understand who I truly, truly am. And we're going to go on a journey, and I hope at this Lent season, I'm praying for a couple things, because I believe this. It doesn't matter if you're Pastor Ken. It doesn't matter if you're an elder. It doesn't matter if this is the first time that you've ever stepped foot in a church. I'm here to tell you that every one of us needs to learn some stuff about Jesus. And every one of us needs to unlearn some stuff about Jesus. And every one of us needs to relearn some stuff about Jesus. And here's what I want you to do, is I want you to experience in this Lenten season as we march towards Victory Day, which is Easter, because the truth is we are Easter people living in a Good Friday world. We are people of the resurrection. We are people of Jesus. And as we march towards victory, I want you to experience Jesus like you've never experienced him before. And I want you to experience him, not just as someone who knows facts about Jesus. I want you to experience him because you know him. You know him. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 16. And this is where Jesus calls his first Talmudim, Hebrew for disciple. It says this, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, we know as Peter, and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Verse 17, Leachrai, in Hebrew, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Hear this, at once they left their nets and followed him. Like, what? Dude's fishing and all of a sudden some random dude walks up and goes, hey, come follow me. Okay. <laughs> Stop what I'm working. I'm just going to go hang out with you. That's just crazy. It gets even better. Verse 19, when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, the strongest name. I love that and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, Leachari, come follow me. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Peace out, Zebedee. I'm going with this dude. Like, what? What in the world is going on? I mean, you have to think about this. We don't have very many contexts in our day where if someone walked up to you and said, hey, come follow me, you're like, sure, sure, I'll do it right now. I mean, let's just say if like Jimbo Fisher walked up to you and was like, hey, I want you to be a 12th man. I want you to come join Texas A&M football. You're like, okay, okay. And, you know, and maybe like if you all of a sudden found this chance to like go play at University of Texas and all of a sudden they're like, hey, come follow me. You are going to be the next Vince Young, and you're like, okay. We don't have very many moments where we've been recruited where we're willing to drop whatever we are doing to actually go. 
And this is, this is like what Mark wants you to understand from the get-go. To live the kind of life where you would say, when I hear the voice of Jesus, I will drop whatever I'm doing. But why? Why would this happen? Why would they just do this? And, and why, like, is Zebedee just kind of like, really? You're leaving me? Like, wh wh why didn't he stop it? To understand this, I need you all to stand to your feet. Even you all who are in the communion room, stand to your feet. And you're like, what's he going to do? <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> but it's going to get even better. I want you to raise your pinky in the air like you just don't care. Fantastic. I'm going to teach you a little bit of Hebrew right now, okay? And I'm, what I'm going to teach you in Hebrew, and you're like, why am I raising my pinky? Because when you walk into a synagogue, and all of a sudden, when they would raise their pinky, they would understand that God is so powerful. There's so much might just in God's pinky. And there's this sense of reverence that, like, I am in this ability to have a personal relationship with God, but he is so powerful. So powerful. And if you ask any Jewish man or woman, like what is like central to being a follower? What is like the central passage in the Old Testament or what we know as the Hebrew scriptures? What is it? They would quote Deuteronomy. And this is what it is in Hebrew. So repeat after me, Shema Rael. You can do it, put a little huh into it, all right? Shema Rael. Adonai Elihinu. Adonai Chad. You have no idea what you just said. You said, hear, O Israel. I know it's nine. I could hear the communion room. Here we go. Hear, O Israel. Israel. The Lord our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God. With all your heart. With all your, with all your mind. With all your, mind. With, all your with, all with all your strength. Very well, Faith Bridge. You may have a seat. Now, this was central to the Hebrew people. It is to love God with all their heart, all their mind, all their strength. And literally, like in Hebrew, the phrase is like, they don't even have a word to translate it. It's like mahode. It literally means like to love God with all of your muchness, every atom, every pound, every square inch of your body to love God. But the question became, how do you pass this same value system on to the next generation? And this is where it became so important. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, you see, it says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your heart, and you are to impress them on your children. Literally, like you are to, like, to take these commandments, and we think of them as like rules and laws, but in Hebrew, it's mitzvot, they're sacred deeds, and you're literally like to impress them into their mind, into their heart, into their system. And then verse seven, it just says you're gonna talk about them. You're gonna talk about these commandments as you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. This is going to be a frequent conversation. But the question became, how do we do this? And there became two central ways for the Hebrew people to actually impress the commandments upon their kids. This is all going somewhere. You have to just trust me. But I'm gonna take you back to the ancient Near East and I want you to understand two realities. What happened at home and what happened in the local synagogues to ensure that these kids understood the commandments. Now, what you have to understand is when a child was like four or five years old, the rabbis and the parents would wrestle with hey, when should we teach these kids the scriptures? Rabbis debated this years and years and years and years. And what we found, history tells us that the age of six is when they would begin. And they had three classes, Bet Sefer, Bet Talmud, and Bet Midrash. Bet literally in Hebrew means house. Sefer is house of the book. Let me talk about the house of the book. A child was six years old, and they'd walk into a local synagogue, and that local Torah teacher would then see this child walking in. And the child would walk in, and, and here's what like, the rabbi would do. My son, my daughter, stick out your hand. And the six-year-old would be like, stick out their hand. And then the rabbi would say, close your eyes. 
And probably this six-year-old, never been in like church before, synagogue before, looks to his mom, looks to his dad. They both nod. And so with one hand, closes his eyes, one hand, hand out. And the rabbi then takes honey and puts it all over the hand of the kid. This kid's only ever eaten grapes and bread and fish. And all of a sudden, the rabbi says, my son, my daughter, taste and see. And literally, the child begins to eat. And this kid's never, ever, ever had sweets before. This is like having Skittles for the first time. <laughs> this is like when you're a one-year-old, and, and parents, you know this, like you've like, you just given your kid like Gerber, you know what I mean? Like you fed them like mashed up spinach and Brussels sprouts, it looks terrible. You don't even feel bad about it. And now you on their one-year-old birthday give them a sprinkled donut and that kid, eyes, open up with this sense of like, number one, this is amazing. And number two, you have been holding out on me, mom. <laughs> a child like just begins to eat, right? So the kid like tastes. And then the rabbi goes, my son or my daughter, what does it taste like? And the first word that the child can say is, it's so sweet. And then the rabbi says, yes, this is what the word of God is like. When you, it is sweet like honey and you will taste and see through God's word that he is good. Can you imagine at six years old, this is the prop to teach you about the word of God? I mean, no flannel graph. I mean, this is just straight food. And all of a sudden, what ends up happening is this child from six to 10 in Bet Sefer, house of the book, begins to discover and memorize the first five books of the Bible. I'm talking Leviticus. I'm talking numbers. And I'm not, I mean, they memorized it. An eight-year-old memorizing the book of Numbers. And if they were really, really, really good, then they would find themselves going to Bet Talmud, which was the next kind of class. And that was from 10 to 14. And Talmud is kind of, Bet Talmud means house of learning. House of learning. And what you do is you'd spend half your time doing your parents' trade. So now remember this. Put this in context with Mark chapter 1. What is Andrew and, and, and John and Simon, what, what, what are they all doing? They're fishermen, okay? They're fishermen. But from 10 to 14, you spend half the time doing whatever your parents did because you got to be able to learn a skill because not everyone can become a rabbi. But a rabbi was like the dream. I mean, kids grow up today and they, like, they want to be like on TV. They want to play for the Houston Rockets. They want to like just, just kind of be... On, on some professional team, back then, they wanted to be rabbis. So from 10 to 14, they would go to Bet Talmud, and here, they wouldn't just memorize the first five books of the Bible, they would begin memorizing the entire Hebrew scriptures, 39 books. And they didn't just know the verses, but they knew interpretations of those verses. And they also began to learn the art of asking questions. See, we, we teach in our school system today, like, hey, what's two plus two? Child goes, four, four. But in a rabbinic culture, when you ask, what's two plus two, and you'd, ask, you'd answer with a question that showcased that you already knew the answer. So if the teacher said, what's two plus two, you'd say, what's three plus one? Then the teacher would say, well, what's two times two? Well, what's six minus two? And this is how they would de debate. When you read the Gospels, and you're going to see this in the book of Mark, they're always um, like amazed at the questions, even when Jesus is the age of 12, remember he goes to the temple and all of these religious leaders are like, dude, this guy's questions, his insights, because he was a part of Bet Talmud. He was a part of the system and he was learning it. Now, if you were the best of the best of the best, you would find yourself going to Bet Midrash. And Bet Midrash, not house of the book, not house of learning, this is house of study. And you had the chance to study with a rabbi who had authority. In Hebrew, it's shmiha, a rabbi who was a traveling rabbi who could offer up new interpretations of the Old Testament. And this is what would happen, is it, as a student would walk up to a rabbi and say, Rabbi, I would like to be your disciple. And then the rabbi would say, well, let me test you. 
Because the rabbi has to understand, do you have what it takes to represent me? Are you good enough to be my disciple? Do you literally have what it takes for me to put my stamp of approval on you? And they'd start asking questions. And if the rabbi felt really, really good that this person was good enough to be their Talmudim, their disciple, then the rabbi would say, Le'achrai, come follow me. And you would join the school and carry the yoke, the set of teaching and interpretations of that rabbi. But here's what you need to understand. No rabbi, you can, you, and I've been to Jerusalem, I've been to Israel, I've studied with rabbis. No rabbi before Jesus ever went after his disciples. And Jesus goes after his disciples and he doesn't go after like, he doesn't go to like rice, all the brilliant kids. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't go to like University of Michigan, my favorite school. He doesn't go to Yale or Harvard. You know where he goes? He goes to like, where the people who have been rejected. And he goes, you know what? I want people who are willing to drop everything. I want people who have heart. I want people who have passion. I want people who have chutzpah. I want people who are willing to be my Talmudim. And all of a sudden, Jesus walks up to some dudes and he goes, Le'akarai. And they're like, are you kidding me? I thought I was rejected. You mean a rabbi wants me? A rabbi thinks I have what it takes? And all of a sudden, I guarantee you, Zebedee, Zebedee was like, yeah. <laughs> I raised my kids right. They're going to be a rabbi. I mean, this was pride. This is joy. This is excitement. And when Jesus is calling this, I need you to hear this. He's calling not the very best. And if you're like me, that ought to be really great comfort. <laughs> because it shows us that, you know what? Jesus can use anybody. He can use anybody. The second way that the, the Hebrew people really wanted to kind of impress the commandments on their kids is around the dinner table, they told stories. I don't know what stories you tell at your dinner table. I don't know what kind of conversations you have, but every week there were three stories that were impressed upon these kids. And the first one was this, Passover. And this was the story of how God rescues this was the story that they told from the book of Exodus, how God rescued the people from slavery. And they just impressed this story. And when they told this story, they kept telling it as if they were in the setting of that story. When we were enslaved, God rescued us. He set us free. The second one is, is, is the crossing of the Jordan. And this is where God's a way maker. And it's basically wanting these kids to understand that whenever you feel like it's too adverse, there's no way out, let me tell you. <laughs> He's a way maker. Do not doubt that God can make a way. Do not doubt that God can do anything. And this was impressed on these kids. And then the third one was about Sinai. And it was where the principles and the values of the Ten Commandments, where God meets the people. And there's a whole wedding ceremony around this, but I, I won't get into that. But the idea was they were teaching the values. And what's incredible is this is what Jesus is. Jesus is gonna be the ultimate Passover. Jesus is the fulfillment of the way maker. And when you go through the book of Mark, you are gonna discover the principles and values for how you can be a Talmudim, a true disciple. Now, you're sitting here probably going, okay, okay, I, I, I sort of get it. You made me raise my pinky, like, cool. What does this mean? Here's what I want you to understand. Sometimes we think of Jesus I don't know what picture you have of him, but what I think about is I think about a rabbi, a teacher. But this wasn't just any kind of rabbi. This was a rabbi who was looking for disciples. And, and again, when I think about a disciple, I'm thinking about someone who, what they long for most in this world is to be like their rabbi, to be like Jesus. And true discipleship really invites us and forces us to really, really wrestle with in every area of my life. What would it look like if Jesus had full control? If Jesus was the loudest voice? When it came to my views on money, on my views on time, my views on my gifts, 
my views in culture, my views in the scripture. My, like, how does Jesus lead as my rabbi? And sometimes we think of Jesus as our savior, fantastic, he is. Sometimes we think of Jesus as like Lord, fantastic. But sometimes it's so disconnected. But when I think about him as a rabbi, I think about him being the guide, the leader, the best version of any person who's ever walked this earth, and it becomes the invitation to say, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. But here's the thing. When I think about Jesus, I think Jesus isn't looking for converts. He's looking for Talmudim. He's looking for disciples. And I remember a number of years ago, I, uh, I, I was a film major, and, I, and I, I had just kind of all of these hopes to tell stories. And my mom, I got to baptize her my, my senior year of high school. And my dad, adopted father, I got to baptize him my sophomore year of college. And I remember when my dad came out of the water, he had, he had gone to USC and studied film. He was a business guy. He came out of the water and he had this moment like, oh my goodness, I feel like I just heard from God. And I was like, that was quick. That's awesome. <laughs> There's something in this water. I'm like drinking it. I'm like, man. And he goes, I, I, I'm like, what'd you hear? And he goes, I just feel like God told me to sell everything and move to Michigan to restore a relationship with my parents. And I was like, what? I mean, we live in California. We live between Malibu and Santa Barbara. You're going to move to Michigan? That wasn't God. Um... <laughs> It wasn't God. I, I'm, a, I'm a backup point guard, like, at Cal State Fullerton. I'm set to be a backup point guard at Cal State Fullerton. And, like, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. I've worked my life. And now I'm watching God starting to work and the thing I've been praying for. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do? And I just feel the sense, like, I'm supposed to go. And I'm studying communications. I'm studying film. And I find myself going there to Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is like the, the belt buckle of the Bible belt. Like it just somehow got to Grand Rapids. And it is, it is like Zondervan and Baker. I, I, never, I never been to some place like this. I mean, I grew up in California, crazy people. And like all of a sudden I come to Grand Rapids and I am like, I, I don't know anybody. And I'm just asking God, man, you gotta guide me. You gotta lead me. And I end up finding this random church because a buddy of mine tells me about it. And this church is meeting in a homeschool building, which I didn't know homeschool had a building, but like, it's cool. But like, it was meeting in a homeschool building. <clears throat> and so I, I literally show up and I get turned away by a fire marshal. There are like too many people in here. I'm like, what? And so I, I show up the next week, and I show up like California does, people do, like the second worship song. And so I show up like seven minutes late. Fire marshal again, too many people. I'm like, what is going on in there? Next week, I show up, and the fire marshal goes, too many people. I'm like, you're joking. There is, there, what is going on? And I find my way sneaking through the back, and during like the first part of the message, I just basically walk through backstage and sit down on the ground. And this guy gets up and he opens the, the book. And they're like in week seven or eight of this church. And he's like, yep, so we're going to continue on teaching through the book of Leviticus. And I'm like, what? There's a fire marshal and people are talking about Leviticus? Like, I thought California was weird. Grand Rapids is crazy. And so all of a sudden, I get so enamored with the Bible in a fresh new way. And this pastor ends up going to Israel. And a guy by the name of Ray Vanderlaan, he's a brilliant, brilliant thinker. Ray Vanderlaan pulls this pastor aside and says, hey, Jesus didn't speak, change the world by speaking to the masses. You know how he changed the world? By having disciples. Who are your disciples? And the pastor was like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. He's like, well, you better be praying about that. So on a flight home, they start praying, and somehow my name comes up. I had gone back now to California. I was doing ministry and Bible college and, and all of this stuff, and I get a phone call from this pastor, and he goes, hey, I believe in you. 
I want to teach you everything I know. Tells me this experience. He goes, I want to invite you. Graduate as fast as you can. Come live in my basement. I'll teach you everything I know. And we're going to change the world one West Michigan at a time. And this was my moment of a rabbi looking at me and saying, Leachrai. And I graduated and I moved back to Grand Rapids. I lived in this guy's basement. And this is where I began every day to study. And I've, as, as I've thought about this, I feel like in our Christian culture, we've lost what discipleship is all about. And as I travel from different churches to different churches and I, and I meet with different people, you know what I often hear? I see that there is this bifurcation in the local church. And this is what happens. You have older people, and I'm gonna call you the wiser people. You have wisdom, and you have like energy and experience and chutzpah and the, and the youth. And here's what often happens. Here's what often happens. Is the older people go, man, like I, don't, I don't like wearing skinny jeans. <laughs> I, I don't... I, I don't feel like I know what I'm supposed to do here. I don't know if I feel like I have a place. And then I get around younger people, and the younger people are like, I don't know how to raise a family. I don't know how to actually be a disciple. I don't know how to do it. And I sit back here, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. I almost want to start, like, an e-harmony for churches and discipleship. <laughs> and I'm like, you... And you should go get coffee. And I'm not saying forever, but like just for a few weeks. And here's the thing, though. I'll sit with older, wiser people, and they're like, yeah, but like, what if they tell me no? It's their loss. It's their loss. Mark Burnett says every time he pitches a show, he's the guy who started The Voice and Survivor, Christian guy, and he goes, every time I pitch a show and I hear the word no, you know what I hear? Next opportunity. And, and, and again, I prayed and I asked for people to mentor and disciple me and I was rejected more times than at a junior high dance. But like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Discipleship. If I want to be like Jesus, I need people who are farther ahead of me to help me walk closer to Jesus. And friends, I'm telling you, if you're younger and you see someone in this community and you go, man, I feel like she is wisdom. Go ask them. Can I buy you a cup of coffee? Just say that because it looks like you're humble, but they'll never make you actually buy it. <laughs> but just say it because it starts you off like, that's a real humble person. But you know what I mean? Like, go up to them and say, hey, I see something in you. Or on the other side, what would it, what would it look like if you all said, you know what? I, I, see someone, I see something. You've got this, like, leadership gift. And I'd love to, like, I'd love to actually just pour into you and affirm you and encourage you. I just want to open up my life. Maybe you can open up your life and maybe we can see what Jesus wants to do. You know what that ends up doing? That ends up taking this culture and it puts us in line, not just with who is Jesus in some theoretical conversation, but it's like we are diving into life in the scriptures and doing it together. Here's my number one question for you. Who is discipling you? And who are you discipling? Because I kid you not, Christianity was never meant to be a solo sport. It's always been about team, and it's always about having great coaches and great people to pour into. This is how we will be the kind of faith that can withstand culture, withstand the, the changing of times, is when we find ourselves saying, you know what? I just want to invest and I want to pour in. Who's poured into you? Who's pouring into you? And who are you pouring into? And friends, let me just tell you, it's always your responsibility. It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility to find mentors. And there's sometimes I just text Pastor Ken and I'm like, hey, can you help me with this? He'll like send me a question. We just go back and forth. And, and, and I have a number of these people around the country. I just find, hey, can I, I'm going to fly there and I'm just going to sit. Can I just take you out to, to dinner? I just questions. How, how do I do this as a man? How do I do this as a pastor? How do I do this as a father? I, I wasn't given a map. And I can literally just say and make an excuse and sit on the bench and in the silence and go like, I wasn't given a map. Or I can take the responsibility and say, hey, hey, 
I got to actually do this and find this so I can lead my kids and lead my family. What about you? I tell you this because there was a guy in the scriptures, and I'm going to end with this, and his name was Timothy. And, and 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy is based on him. But Timothy is a fascinating character. We meet Timothy in Acts chapter 16, and he has become one of my favorite, favorite, favorite people. And in Acts chapter 16, it says this. It'll be up on the screen. It says that Paul came to Derby, and, and, and then to Lystra. And when he gets to Lystra, there's this disciple, this Talmudim named Timothy, and this is where he lived. And this is what it says, it's so amazing. Whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. Now, what I need you to understand is, if you read that in Jewish context, you're like, there's no way that Timothy could be a disciple. Because there were rules, and you can get to the Torah and the book of Deuteronomy, you could see that if your mother or father was Jewish, but they married someone who was not Jewish, you weren't allowed to enter into synagogue. So, so now you've got Timothy, and we learn from 2 Timothy that his mom and his grandmother, Eunice and Lois, they poured into him, they taught him those three stories, and he was like, I want to learn, but he could never show up to church. And I just picture this young kid standing outside, wishing he could get in. And then all of a sudden, as like everybody's leaving, he's like, hey, can I have your sermon notes? What pastor Ken talk of? What did he say? Can you imagine if there was like some nine-year-old who was like, so, so what did the pastor say? What song did they sing? Did they, did they sing like, did they sing the Raise a Hallelujah song? I love that song. No, they, they didn't sing. Oh, okay. Well, what about here? What, what else did, they, did you guys pray? I mean, this, this kid had passion. And in Acts chapter 16, it says Timothy meets Paul. And then Paul actually is like, I like this guy. And Paul's on a journey, and you know what he's doing? He's looking for Talmudim. He's looking for disciples. And I guarantee you, some elders in Lystra pulled Paul aside and said, hey, dude, you can't take this kid. He can't be your disciple. They're like, why? The, guy, the guy's got passion. He's got chutzpah. He's this young leader. I see so much in him. And I think that some of them probably pulled him aside and said, you don't understand. His mom's Jewish. His dad's Greek, which makes him a mamzer, which means he hasn't been circumcised. If you don't know what circumcision is, ask your mom. But like, literally, <laughs> like he hasn't been circumcised. He, he's not fully one of us. He's not fully one of us. And maybe you, you feel this. Maybe you feel this. I didn't grow up with great parents. My past Maybe you're like, I've messed so many things up. Maybe in this last season, you're like, man, I have just reverted back. And you're like, man. And Paul, in this moment, he has a decision. And the simple decision is, is he actually going to take Timothy as his Talmudim? And you've all read this verse from Galatians 3. But I think this passage of scripture is about Timothy. And I believe it's like about people like me and some of you. Because Paul writes these words, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither Peter nor Timothy, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Here's what I need you to know. It does not matter if you came from the best schools Jesus is still calling you to be his Talmudim. It doesn't matter if you came from the worst schools. Jesus is still calling you to be his Talmudim. It doesn't matter if you've never, ever train wrecked and sabotaged the goodness of the story that God wants to write in your life or if you continue to sabotage. Jesus is looking for disciples. And not just people who will know facts about Jesus, but the kind of disciples who go out and make disciples, who 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 make disciples. Who make disciples. And this has been my prayer. My prayer is that today and during this Lenten season, you would want to know who Jesus truly is. You would want to know him for yourself. On February 17th, 1963, 
There was a man born in Brooklyn, New York. And this man, I mean, this man by the age of two ended up moving to North Carolina. He had some older siblings. He loved the game of baseball. His dad loved the game of basketball. He started playing. Sophomore year of high school gets cut at Laney High. Junior year makes the varsity. Senior year, he becomes an All-American, goes to the University of North Carolina. As a freshman, hits the game-winning shot against Georgetown. A couple years later, he gets drafted third overall in the NBA. He's the rookie of the year. He signs with Nike. He didn't want to. Next year, blows out his knee. Just incredible. Comes back. He dominates. I can tell you about how this man met his wife at a Bennigan's restaurant. I can tell you, I could tell you story after story. I could tell you his stats. I could tell you about the drama of the dream team. I could tell you what actually happened at the flu game. I could tell you about his kids. I could tell you about all of the shoes and how they got designed. Friends, I could tell you fact after fact after fact about Michael Jeffrey Jordan. But if any of you ever asked me, Steve, have you met him? I'd say no. You know what we call those people? Stalkers. <laughs> and here's what I'm telling you. I think some of you know so many stories and facts about Jesus, but do you really know him? Do you know him? There's something inside you that says, man, I just want to be his disciple. I want to follow him. And if that becomes you, then all of a sudden you go, man, then I want to actually help others follow him. And so I'm just going to lead us in a response time. And there's basically three movements of this response time. And the first movement is this. Just imagine Jesus right now, and he's just coming up to you. And he's saying, Leakarai. Leakarai. Come follow me. And in your own way right now, I'm just going to invite you. Just to say, in this season... Yes or no? And maybe you're just kind of checking Jesus out. And I want you to say, please keep coming on this, in this series. Because you're going to learn who Jesus is. Who he is for you. Who he is for this world. But if he is literally inviting you to be his disciple, maybe that means you just got to text Lent to 797979. And you're like, man, I just need to get in the word. Maybe there's just some things that you just need to ask Jesus, what's my next best right step? The second thing that I'm going to ask you to think about is who do you need to go ask, hey, can I buy you a cup of coffee? And would you just teach me? Or maybe who do you need to pursue and just say, hey, I see something in you. And I just want to encourage you. And I'd love just to spend a few moments just opening up God's word, just opening up my life. Again, if you like want to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples, you got to have disciples. If not, it's okay. Stalk Jesus. Know the facts. But if you want to know him, then you have to live as he calls us to live. And the third one. A third one, and I'm just going to simply say, I find myself so compelled by that phrase, victory is here. And Easter's coming. And this march through the book of Mark is a chance for us to go public. And there's something that's really public when you literally like put kind of a, a sign in your front yard and you're like, victory's here. Because it means that you can't speed down your, your, your street. It means that you have to wave to your neighbors, even the ones whose lawn is way better than yours. It, it means that, that you literally go, I'm going to live like a disciple. And I think it, it, it calls us to live a little bit differently, but it also invites others to go, oh, there's something different about them. And here's what I just want to pray. I want to pray that we, Faith Bridge, would have the chutzpah and the passion. One, to not stalk Jesus, but to know him. Two, that we'd get after and begin to find disciples. And three, that we'd go public with our words, with yard signs, so that everybody can know the truth that is the man, the rabbi the Lord, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. So God, I pray. I pray right now for my friends. There's so many times where I feel like we just kind of, 
go through the motions. But discipleship isn't about being perfect. It's about just trying to get as close to your son as possible. And God, I pray that any of my friends right now who maybe go, I don't know if I can do that. Or I don't know if I have what it takes. Can I just remind them? In your spirit, just remind them that Peter was a reject. Timothy was a mamzer. Paul was a murderer. You had tax collectors, people who just committed treason, zealots, people who'd killed people. You called all of the people who nobody would expect and you transformed their lives and you transformed culture. God, do it again. Fill our heart with the vision to know you and to know others so that they can know you. And let us be bold in going public. We give you the glory and all God's people said, amen.